are you from? What did you do before you joined the service? Well, uh, starting originally, I was born in Alexandria in 1926. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I lived in Alexandria from then to about 1932, I guess. Mm -hmm. Then we moved to uh, Rayville, Louisiana, which was in Rapids Parish. And I lived there until 1939. And uh, my mother and dad separated when I was six years old. So, I mean, I don't give me interest in that. But anyway, I just thought that was a start. So then I, I lived there until I was 13. And my dad married again, and he married a woman that was only only ten years older than me. And uh, I, I guess you know, I just we couldn't get along. So at thirteen, my dad advised me to leave, and I did. Well, I knocked around from place to place. I I went and lived with a man that had nine daughters at first, and I used to get a lot of a raw, a real rawhide about that. And he paid me 50 cents a day to farm it. Then from that, I, was, I went up into Rayville and I bought me a pair of shoes for $2.50. That was my week's pay. And I met one of my cousins there, and he lived in McGee, Arkansas. And he worked for the Missouri, Missouri Pacific Railroad. He was a conductor on train. And uh, he loaded me up and said, you're not living here. You're going to, Arkan to McGee, Arkansas with me. Okay. So we came to Delhi and got on the train, and I went to McGee, Arkansas, and I lived there a while. How old were you at that time? Uh, I would say 14. I hadn't been gone from home very long, so I, wasn't, I may not have been quite 14. But anyway, I stayed there a while, and of course, he didn't have any children, he and his wife. And to put it bluntly, she was hell on wheels. So she had a, they had a little nephew there of his brother's little boy. He was just a baby. So they decided they wanted to carry him to Holly Ridge, a little place called Holly Ridge there in Rayville, right off of Interstate Highway 20. And they got me to go on the bus and bring him. Now, this was during the week. They was going to pick me up on a Saturday. All I had on my back was what, what I had on. They was going to bring me my clothes. I never did get my clothes and didn't see them until I was grown and married, which was in about 48, 49, I'd say, you know, roughly. And then from there, well, before that, I guess I've got a little ahead of that story, but that's how that lined up. But uh, then I joined the Navy in August of 43. Well, let's, let's stop there. When, uh, after... That happened with you and your, your cousin. What did you do after that? Where did you go? Well, I came uh, to Alec and tried to live at my mother. She re had remarried again. And uh, that really didn't work too good. Uh, my stepfather was quite a bit older than her. And uh, so one day he told me, you know, it was, you know, Mr. Thornhill, I don't want you in my house. Don't you on my place. Now he's out in the field plowing and she had, my mother asked me to carry some water out there and that's when he told me that. So I left and I never did go back. But from there I worked on the construction work. They were building a levee on the other side of Red River around uh, Ruby. And I, I worked there a while until the job was finished. And then after that, well, I didn't follow it and I, I went ahead and joined the Navy because I got tired of knocking around. Now, <clears throat> where were you when you heard about uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor? Do you recall? Uh, yeah. I believe I was working for a grocery store in Alexander there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was very, I was still, you know, I was lucky that I got a job because it didn't amount to much, but it was, it, it fed me. And uh, that, that's, that's about it. Then uh, I did work at the Hodge Stockyard for a while there, and, uh, and that was just, just before I joined the Navy, and I went ahead and joined. And from there, I went to San Diego, 
Well, why, why did you decide on the Navy and not the Army or the Marine Corps or Air Force? or Why the, why the Navy in particular? Well, you know, I, I've often wondered about that. But uh, I guess when it was having the maneuvers there before the war, the, in Louisiana, all those maneuvers, right. I went out into the woods where there was, you know, I was just a little bit of a fella, you know, probably wouldn't, but maybe 10 or 12, and, and, and seeing how they was living and all of that, it looks to me like when that mess hall was cooking out in the woods that the, they had more flies than they had anything else. So I just I just thought, well, if I'm going to go in, I think I'll just join the Navy. But really, I just kind of got tired of myself, you know, just going here to there, to living. I never could live with anybody my age. I had to live with people older because they could furnish me a place to sleep and furnish me something to eat. So I had to create a, a, a my age to, just unconsciously to be too old for kids my age because they couldn't help me. I had, to, I had to socialize with people that had something put on the table. And so that's what caused that. And then I just... I don't, I don't ever know why I decided to join the Navy, but I did. Well, when you, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. When you, uh, when you signed up for the Navy, did, uh, did they send, they sent you straight to San Diego for boot training, or? Yes. Did it? Sure tell, did. Tell me about that. Tell me about boot camp. Well, uh, we had a good many boys from around Alexandria there, and that went through the boot camp, then they finished up the companies out of people like in California, which I call prune pickers. And uh, so we went there, it was six weeks, I believe, we went through boot camp. Uh, it, was, it was pretty hard on us sometimes because sometimes you, we'd be marching or something like that, and you'd always have somebody have to talk in ranks. And you wound up having to do double time for miles. <laughs> and and that went on through that, the boot camp there. We used to double time down to Redondo Beach, uh, going down there, walking. It was about, I don't know, five or ten miles. And they'd go through swimming lessons and different things like that, you know, just to kind of get us organized on how to survive in the ocean, pull your pants off, make water wings out of them pull your shoes and all that out while you're trying to tread water and swim and it was hard on me because I've never been a real strong swimmer but I managed to get by and then we finished up there and we went to San Pedro a little island fishing island out in California where there's a port for, for the seafood mm -hmm. and uh, that, in other words that's after we finished boot camp and I met up with a few fellas there, and then one, one old long tall boy, I can't think of his name now, was off on a work detail one day and uh, wanted to send somebody to Honolulu. So they asked if they knew anybody else to finish out the deal, so they, he'd give them my name. So I wound up on a Liberty ship going to Honolulu. Well, on the way on the ship there, they always, you know, it was a merchant ship, really, merchant marines on it. And they had little boxings and different things like that. So they put one of the mess cooks up was a merchant marine, and he had how to put on gloves. So we did. We have got the same size. And I never knew he was a golden glove. Well, when we was boxing, we were actually, I guess you say, fighting. He hit me every way from Sunday. I couldn't get away from him. He'd, he'd come up with his head laying against my chest like that, working on my guts. So I finally, I'm left hand. I laid my right hand on his head and I showed him back. I popped it to him. He went back. But as he went away, he caught me on the chin. After that, you know, we went to the mess hall and he cooked me a steak in a platter about that big. And he liked to die laughing. That's when he told me he was a golden glove. And I couldn't eat the steak because I couldn't laugh and I couldn't chew. So that kind of ended all that stuff, but that was just the beginning of that. And then we got to Honolulu. We wasn't there too long, and then that's when the ship came in from Alaska, all beat up, rode out a storm, and so that's what I got on it in Honolulu. 
Well, let me let's backtrack just a, just a bit. <clears throat> I understand you were a gun captain. Yeah, or a forty millimeter. And where did you take your where did you get your gunnery training in San Diego or? Right aboard ship. Oh, so you learned on the fly. You you learned aboard ship. Okay. All right. Well, when you got when you're in Honolulu there in, in, in uh, Pearl Harbor, Daly comes in. And that's what you picked Daly up there in, in in Pearl Harbor. Yes. And how did that come about? Were they looking for? Did they need people, or were, did you have orders to go aboard? Or how did that how did that come about? Well, the only thing I ever do is just come in and they just needed some, you know, crew members. Mm -hmm. They may not have had a full complement, or then it could have been when they come in, they may have been some of them, you know, that got transferred. I never never even gave that a thought. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's how it came about. Now, when I struck for Gunner's Mate, uh, they give us a, a written test. Well, the written test was, you know, yes and no questions, things like that. Uh, and it pertained most to farm machinery, stuff like that. So it was so easy, I, I took the test and I made a 3.9 because I, didn't want, I could have made 4.0, but I didn't want to, you know. I said, that, that don't look good to me. So then after I made it, then the other boys that had went to school from boot camp and got aboard ship, I made Gunner's Mate third the same time they did. So they wouldn't speak to me, they wouldn't have to do with me. So in all of these years that they were having these uh, uh, reunion meetings all over the country, some here in New Orleans, New York, Honolulu, and ever, I never would go because uh, you know they, you know, there's just a, a lot of hard feelings. I guess didn't bother me because what I needed was a little extra money because I was sending an allotment home to my mother because she had. The stepfather had died, and uh, she had four little kids. So I sent her that, and I sent oil buds. And that's the only way I could help out. That's one of the reasons I went in the Navy, because she needed some help. And I guess it fell on my back. Was uh, was when you joined the Navy, was that the first time you you had three square meals a day? And, and what now? When you joined the Navy, was that the first time in your life that you had three square meals a day and a roof over your head all the time? At that particular time, yeah. I mean, beans and rice was pretty good. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't gripe about the food because I was glad to get it. I didn't cause any trouble in the Navy. I, I kept my nose clean because, you know, <laughs> and growing up, what little girl growing up I did at home, well, uh, if I made a mistake, I paid dearly for it. So I had to learn to keep my mouth shut and just and do what I was told and say yes sir, no sir. So you know that kind of makes a big difference with your attitude in life if you've got respect for yourself and other people. Because if I made a smart remark to someone else when I was at home, my daddy would he'd use that big wide belt or a big peach tree limb. Sometimes it had to be a peach tree limb. So it was it was it was hard on my butt, but I managed. <laughs> well, you uh, <clears throat> you get aboard ship, and you guys leave Pearl Harbor, and according to what I was reading, you went to New Guinea. New Guinea, yes, yeah. Buena Bay. Uh -huh. What did you guys do out there? What, what well, when we went into there, uh, you go into the harbor, and it was. High mountains, like all around, it looked weird, you know. But all of it was growed up in foliage, and then when you got to where the land was kind of a little flatter, well, it was loaded up with uh, coconut trees. So we went in there and stayed up. And our first trip, we escorted LSTs from there to Cape Gloucester, mm -hmm. and that's where we lost our sister ship. Well, them old LSTs wouldn't go with about three knots. So it was. We just have to patrol, and circle around, just keep them screened, till we got to Cape Gloucester, and then we stayed out there away from the beach and kind of screened while it was unloading the troops and equipment at Cape Gloucester, and that's when the vile dive bombers come in and uh, sank the sister ship. And it was kind of weird when that dive bomber hit. It was right 
right in the stack area that, like you might have seen in these posts around, used around the post office, where it said loose lips sink ships, and it just folded up in the middle like that and went down about 700 fathoms of water. The first man we picked up and never swum a day in his life. He learned to swim that day. Well, we was picking him up in there and we got in over the top about where the ship sank. And as it sank so far, the depth charges went off. Well, it damn near lifted us out of the water and it broke the keel of the ship. So when we got back to Boona Bay in New Guinea, we had put us in dry dock and a lieutenant colonel, uh, he was a major. Uh, I take it back. He was a commander. He was a commander. <laughs> I, did I get it right? Navy, not army. Yeah, I had to think about him, and you know, with the army. And so he, when he was welding it up, he staked his rank on it. And I guess he did, because we went on from there, and we went to into the Admiralty Islands. Well, look, tell me about the. You guys shot down a couple of aircraft there, didn't you? At, at Millen Bay. At, at Cape Gloucester, uh -huh. we shot down several planes. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Well, we shot down ten planes all together. Mm -hmm. We sank a battle wagon, a battle wagon, and a cruiser and destroyer, and la a Saragar Straits in the Philippines. Right. But that's that's getting a little ahead of well, you know we'll story. We'll but uh, we uh -huh. made we made just bukus of bombardments, bombarding the beach for the troops going in, mm -hmm. stuff like that, mm -hmm. and more or less just shooting down coconut trees because you'd show a salvo and hit them old trees, you hit them with a bottom. Tops would go back towards the ocean, and bottoms would go like you hit them with a bulldozer. And we bombarded beaches like that. At one particular time there, the tube in the five-inch guns run out about that far. It got so hot, I had to saw them off with a hacksaw. Burned all the paint off the barrel. And so that went on. We made, I, don't, I don't know right now, but I could look at that book and tell you how many bombardments we made. And uh, then after that, that deal, we went to uh, the Admiralty Islands. The island was just, wasn't much about that high off the sea level, but it was an airport there on Carl. And so we, we worked there for a time. It had a little harbor there you could get in. And we finally got off the beach and had a little beer party. They always have a quart of beer for everybody from Australia, and it was very strong. I guess if you hadn't had beer in a while, it was... Oh, no, look. Well, didn't get off the ship, just for something like that, just very occasionally, if it was pretty safe and all of that. Now, we did go to Sydney, Australia twice. Tell me about that. You went, you made Liberty in Sydney? Made Liberty in Sydney twice. The... Uh, I guess the first first time we went to Sydney uh, is after we made the invasion at Leyte, I believe. Uh, actually, I think it's right before. From what, I, from what I'm reading here, it was the first time you went to Sydney was right before Leyte. Yeah, well, that's, that's, I didn't remember that exactly. I never thought about it, you know. It was in late August. Yeah, August okay. And uh, what would you do in Sydney on Liberty? Everything we could. We all had pretty good girlfriends. Uh, there was a lot of good-looking women there, but uh, a lot of the time when they were 17 years old and had a tooth in their head. They, I guess the water was bad. And uh, it was weird. Uh, a lot of times you'd be, you could ride a streetcar for a penny and get changed back. I'm serious. And then you could see a lot of those taxis and cars like to be traveling. They wouldn't. They didn't have gas, but they'd have this big rubber balloon on top. They'd have a burner on the back where they burned coal or something like that and make their own gas to operate off of that. Which they thought about it after war, doing that here. Nobody knew nothing about it. But they was doing it all during the war there, did. And so we stayed there about 30 days, I guess. And then... Then you, you guys headed to the Philippines after that. Yeah, then we hit the Philippines. We, after, uh, it, 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 uh, I think it came, uh, Admiral T. Islands, I believe it was, we usually was landing the 1st Caliber Division. 
And we'd always take a big crew of them on for R&I, and they'd go with us on these invasions and bombardments and little deals. And uh, so then we, when we went to the Philippines, Leyte there was well, a pretty good pile of ships because we ganged up at Saipan. And uh, it, was a, it was a herd of them. Well, we landed them at Leyte, and I used to watch them going up and down the beach with them little old small tanks and 37 millimeter cannons, clearing them beaches up. And we weren't too far. I mean, out there where we were anchored out, they have a lot of poles and they were, they baited, I guess they would fish and stuff like that. Had little air staked off to fish. And you could be sitting there and you'd watch them Japanese bodies come floating out with their knees all drawn up like that. Just like fleas on a dog's back. And there's nothing no more stinking in a dead human body that's <laughs> it's deteriorating. So that that went on like that, and we went out from there then one night, kind of on submarine patrol, and we come across this little old sand pan. Well, we put our guns on him and finally got him up close to us. It happened to be a Navy lieutenant had been in the Philippines all this time. And I'm going to tell you this, it was funny what he said, you know, they asked him what he did and where he stayed. He said, well, the only thing he had to sleep on was a little thin Filipino woman. <laughs> and his name was Iris Smith. And he wrote a book about it. I've seen the ads of it, but I never did read the book. But then that, that's when then, I guess it was the next day or so, when the Japanese was coming through the Saragar Straits. One fleet was, and one was outside. Admiral Hawes had got sent off on a wild goose chase out of the world. He wasn't even there with his fleet right. and the carriers. Right. But we had our battle wagons and all of that there because they was part of the invasion fleet. Well, when they got the word that the Japanese were coming through Saragar Straits, we sent out 28 PT boats to intercept. And our squadron destroyed destroyers, I think it might have been four or five, I don't really remember exactly. I mean, it wasn't too many, but our, my ship was a squadron ship. Uh, we went past them because, you know, the radar, the radar won't pick you up anything between you and land. It'll hit the land bounce back. So we went past them while the PT boats were harassing them. You know, shooting, man, they were shooting at them PT boats and they were just, you know, like a bunch of hornets. <laughs> Well, when we went to pass, we turned around and come back. Well, when we did, they were signaling. We thought they thought we were one of their ships with the signal, and that's when the executive officer told the captain, "No, sir, those are enemy shoot." So when we hit the, you know, the cruisers and destroyers were ahead of the battle wagon. Well, we sank the battle wagon with torpedoes. Then we sank the cruiser and the destroyer with our five-inch guns. We never got a scratch. The next morning we went back out and we went by and we tried to pick up survivors and they wouldn't come aboard so we just left them. We went back out and that's when the, the battle wagons and the cruisers and destroyers call what they call crossing the T. They had this channel blocked off this way where anything coming, they had to come right into them. Well, when we got out there, as you could see where they was crossing, you know, going back and forth, there was one Japanese destroyer left and a cruiser asked permission to open fire. Well, the Japanese turn destroyer was going away. He was hauling butt. Well, they bracket fired him. They throw the salvo in front and one in the back and drop one right in the middle. And I'm gonna tell you, it was just like striking a match. And it was gone. I mean, it, just a little puff of smoke. It wasn't nothing. The only ship that got hit there was the Claxton. It was a destroyer like I was on. And come to find out later, one of my Stepsister's brother, husband was on that one. They called it the Claxton. And it knocked a big hole in the paint locker. And that was the only ship that got hit. But I've seen all this stuff on TV about, you know, the, talking about the Philippines, Leyte, the Saragar Straits, and nothing. They ain't nothing like it. Well, tell me, you, you're up top side well, during that event, right? Yeah. What, what, what were you seeing? What, what did it look like when, when you guys were engaging those Japanese ships that night? Well, it looked like lightning bugs on them because the fire was flying. And, of course, I was on a 40 millimeter, and I didn't have anything to do because they was just using the 5-inch guns and torpedoes. 
Well, I was sitting there with that hell, phone helmet on, no holding the phone helmet while it shook. And so that's all I had to do, you know, just stand there and watch. And uh, what could you see? Well, all I could see was fire flying because it was in dark, right. pitch dark. So you could only just see a silhouette of them as we was going by. How close were you to them, the Japanese? Well, I don't want to see it. Would look kind of weird, but if, to me, I would say it wasn't more than two locks. If it was that far, yeah. right there, because we was going through the streets. And you had to be close to launch the torpedoes anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So. Uh, then I, th I guess that's when we, I guess that's, yes, that's when, because the, then the suicide plane just started hitting about the time we left there, and I believe that's when we came on back to San Francisco to go into dry dock, mm -hmm. and we stayed in the dry dock there to get all the bronicles off the bottom of the ship and clean up the, the pr props and all that. Uh, I came home then for my little stay while that was happening and I stayed till the very last day leaving Alexander just supposed to be back and I got lucky and I got a C-47 out of the air at England Air Base and rode to California I got there just in time <laughs> I wasn't eating, I wasn't I wasn't absent from leave so then from there we came back and that's I guess when we we met up also at Saipan, and that's when we went to Iwo Jima. And you guys, when you got off of Iwo, uh, you guys rescued some 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 uh, try again some survivors from uh, sunken carrier, didn't you? Well, yeah, we 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 were out on patrol. We had these little old pocket aircraft carriers, and the Saratoga was there. That was about the largest carrier we had at the time, and it was pretty well over there, way over there a distance from us, you know, almost to the horizon, because that was their area. Well, it was late in the evening, and a, a, a torpedo plane come in right over our fin tail and crashed into that little aircraft carrier, they call them jeep carriers, and uh, sunk it. So we picked up survivors, and while we were there doing that, the Saratoga was shooting at other planes that was on them, and you could hear them salvos coming like a freight train from that, the guns on the Saratoga. And it's hitting right there close to us, just roaring and wham, the water was going everywhere. Uh, so we had a little a lieutenant, his name was Lieutenant Briggs, and he had a foot about that long, only about 300. He was too big for a fighter pilot because that's what he trained for. He said, Thorny, what do you think of that? I said, I don't want to go home. To hell with this. Because <laughs> they was, you know, trying to survive too. And so, and shooting those, well, they was, they was kind of scaring us pretty good. So we, that dang carrier, though, it sank just like that with that one torpedo plane hitting it. And it come right in over us. It wasn't, it was interesting that carrier because we was too small. But later on, when we was out on picket, picket duty at Okinawa, well, that was another story altogether. Now that's where we really got our damage. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about that. I know that the story of the Radar picket ships at Okinawa is, is that was some pretty hazardous duty. You know. Well, what we would do, see, we'd go out on picket duty, we'd go out about 75 miles from Okinawa uh, between there and Japan. And what we were doing on that picket duty is we could pick up planes or whatever was coming in on our radar and relay the message in to give them more time to get ready because we had a pretty big fleet there at Okinawa, carriers and stuff like that. And uh, some of them Japanese planes, when some of them come in there, we had a, a cover of about four planes. We either had F-6Fs uh, uh, or F-4U, Corsairs. And uh, they would be just circular. So when we'd pick them up on radar, the Japanese would call them bogies. There's bogies out here a certain amount, and they'd send them out, and they'd attack. But if the bogies got by them and followed them in, those planes had to follow them right on in and keep trying to shoot them down, regardless of where it might have where it hit us or not. Well, that's really one of the things that happened to me when my crew there, one of my boys, this plane was coming in, that one that crashed and damaged the ship, but he missed us enough that we survived. 
and one of them 50 caliber slugs went through one of my uh, pointers. That's the man on the side that swings the gun around. He was a trainer, rather, pointers elevation. And that 50 caliber slug went through his helmet and creased his head, and he fell off in my arms. And I helped him down. And uh, in the meantime, the doctor was always on my gun up there. Oh, well, I don't know why he was up there. And him and a couple other men, for some reason or other, and when that suicide plane hit there, it blowed his head off completely. Wasn't nothing but his chin left like that. And I picked him up like a suitcase by the belt and throwed him out of the way. Well, when this boy fell off of my arms, I was going to help him down to where I could call a fire control. It was down midship down there. They were strictly for fires or repair damage, whatever they had. That was their job, just to take care of damage. And I motioned for him to come get him, you know, because he was in bad shape. And this little Lieutenant Carlson, Thorny, you get back on that gun. Well, Lieutenant Briggs is up there in the control tower, and he knew what I was doing. He said, Carlson, you leave Thorny alone. He would start messing with him and said, I'm going to drag you up and down this deck. You're going to be squealing like a new tar, because he knew what I was doing. I got back on my gun, then... Of course, getting a little ahead of myself, that's what happened when we was chasing them two Japanese destroyers that night out of New Guinea. And we was under this little piece of tarpaulin and they took off one of the torpedo tubes because one of them had a metal house on the other and was naked. Well, they had the instrument and everything covered up with that tarp. And we didn't have nothing else to do, so all my gun crew got under that. Well, he was there and he wanted us to get out so he could get under it. I'm going to be honest with you, had an old boy by the name of Hill. He said, you son of a bitch, we'll throw you overboard. Well, he didn't want to get out of there no more. But now later, and all these years after the war was, he did get missing his sea. How, I don't know. But I know because I used to get letters from it quite often. Because they always, every time they send you a letter, it was always in remember of the boy from Tennessee, which was named Michael Way, Michael Gay. And uh, the other was named Schultz, and then the doctor. And that was uh, that was always it. But now, I guess somebody throwed him overboard, because he was just that kind of a fella. He he was just uh, he was from Pennsylvania. Now I don't know where you're from, yeah. but you could tell one before as you could see him, because all he had to do was open his mouth, and you knew his you knew he was from Pennsylvania. Well, tell me, um, where, where was your gun? Where, where was your gun position? My you, gun was right under the bridge on the port side, okay. forward. So you were up forward, yeah. Yeah, forward, 40 miller, twin mount. And, uh, of course, at Okinawa there, after we come in, back in from off of that deal and picket duty, we were anchored there pretty close to the Buckner Bay, and a Japanese plane come in. And we had a boy by the name of... Henry Tiger, he was from Oklahoma, Indian. And we had three 20, 40, 20 millimeters on the fan tail right back in amongst the depth charges. And this Japanese plane was coming in there, and that Tiger shot that thing down with that 20 millimeter, and we picked up spark plugs off the ship the next day. And when it was coming in over the island, and they swung this 5H38 number two mount right over my head, that close. And this lieutenant didn't tell me they was going to do anything. He was supposed to let me know what was going on. Well, when they fired, it blowed me down, flat on my back, and busted my eardrum. I couldn't hear it thunder for 30 days. And that's why I'm wearing hearing aids. And uh, so then from there, well, it wasn't too long that uh, we started escorting battle wagons and two pocket battleships, the Alaska and the Guam. A pocket battleship is between a heavy cruiser and a battle wagon. Right. And we escorted them to, to the Yellow China Sea up to the mouth of the Yancey River, you know, searching for a coastal ship and stuff like that. And then we got into the uh, Yellow Sea there in the China, off the China coast, and uh, there wasn't supposed to be any Chinamans out there, but they'd be out there fishing them old junky ships they got. And uh, we'd shoot marker shells out of red, blue, green, yellow, purple. And some of them would sink because they wasn't supposed to be out there. And we didn't know but what they might be the enemy. We didn't know. 
So that went, that didn't go too good, I guess, with China. But we did that right up to the mouth of the Yancey River. And then we come in, the war was over that day. And we got into Buckner Bay. A plane slipped in and sank one of our battle wagons. And I can't remember the name of it right now off of my head. But we come in there and that, that happened. And I never seen so much ammunition fire firing going on in my life with them boys celebrating that war being over with. But I guess I'm just kind of reminiscing a different round. I'm not holding it in, in line, but uh, that's okay. That's okay. I mean, that's about the way it was. Now, they was world of suicide planes hitting them aircraft carriers out there. Off the, we, we had an island, I can't remember the name, but it was way away from uh, Okinawa there, but it had a cove in there and high hills all around, and that's where we'd go in there for repairs and stuff like that. And, a, and, a, that, and that little cove. Yeah, Karamaretto. Yeah. And uh, so I used to watch them Japanese planes and them suicide planes come with them old biker, biker bombers, you know, with the jets. Them beef beddies would fly them in there and they'd get out, turn them loose, and they'd try to crash on the ship. Well, it'd be about as much streaks of air, skies like the, air, the jets fly all around us here, you know. But we'd never get hit with them, but them Japanese planes would be coming in and we'd have corsairs out there covering and they'd come in behind them and hit them and they'd automatically burn the time you hit because they didn't have no, they didn't have sealant tanks. They wouldn't like ours, you know. And you'd hit them they'd just burn up and they'd just stop midair and start flipping like that. It's getting hit from behind because <laughs> them corsairs were bad. Well, um, the, the day Daly got that damage. You, your gun shot down that plane right off the port beam, didn't you? That that was your gun when you said that one. I re no, it I, no, I, it did not because it come in off of the starboard side. It did over us. It did crash because it was coming into the ship, you know, and it just missed us. I see. I am and hit right down with the side. See, it was coming from the starboard side, and it wound up crashing on the port side. <laughs> no, yeah, starboard is. Starboard is uh, on the right left, port, port, yeah, right. Yeah, and when that when that plane exploded, that's what took the the officer's head off. Yes, yeah. it took my phones off. It scalped me up a little spot about like that big. Just I had the old headphones, you know, it just had a little metal strap on like they used for strapping up crates, mm -hmm. and it just clipped on. They fell down around my neck, and a piece. My life jacket saved me there. A piece went through that life jacket and just barely stuck my stomach. So it was closed. They carried me down, throwed stuff, suffered drugs on it, and that's all they ever did. Were you ever frightened? Well, uh, I would say this. I was fairly, pretty nervous at times. I mean, you, you listen. <laughs> when you got nowhere to go but stand there and take it, you're going to shake a little. But then there is times, like at night, when you'd be there and you think everything's peaceful and quiet, and those Japanese would come in just close enough you could pick up, up on radar, and you'd think they were getting ready for them to come in, and you'd be all set up half the damn night. Then they'd just fade out. Well, you'd get settled down, and here they'd come back again. You'd get so exhausted and worried. I prayed to be killed a gajillion times. You know, I just tired of it. But it worked out. Uh, but I, I really, I really did. I wish they'd kill me a many times because I, you, know, you just get so tired. But it worked out all right. What was, um, what was life like on a destroyer during the war in the Pacific? I mean, it was a small ship, so you kind of knew. You must have known damn near everybody aboard. Well, you, you pretty well knew everybody. Uh, uh, it's just like anywhere else uh, where you got a lot of people there. You got some damn good people, and you got some that says horses manure. And uh, you stayed busy all the time. I mean, you, you if you wasn't on watch on your gun, standing by, you was chipping paint or fixing something. So. In other words, it was it was a never-ending job for just keeping busy. Now, 
I, I, I lived through one, one day. Uh, it was one day and one night. I crossed the equator seven times. In other words, like Sunday, Monday, Sunday, Monday, Sunday, Monday. <laughs> so that's, that's weird. But, uh, uh, you know, we just, we stayed busy today. Uh, well, the only time you knew if it was Christmas or a holiday when they'd have turkey or something like that. There wasn't no, they actually wasn't no holidays. You just, from time to time you got a chance to have a little holiday to go on a little beer party on the beach where it was, everything was well secured. So that, that's about it. You, you mentioned crossing the equator. Uh, I know the old Navy tradition of uh, King Neptune's party. Did you guys do? Yeah, I went through that shell too. Shellbacks and polywogs. Oh yes, that. sir. Yes, sir. They put us all up there with polywogs. And the barber cut all of our hair off our head. I mean, just shaved it. And right where they had us up there, was on a gun mount up on the second. Then they had a a big vat, a canvas there made out of like a bathtub, mm -hmm. and all this hair and this snot and everything else was falling in that vat. And when they got through cutting your hair, they the knee shakes, you shoved you off in that. So you got when you got your Neptune card. But I, I don't want to ever do them. I lost mine. But, boy, I tell you what, I was nauseated going in that mess. But it didn't bother them, you know. The officers weren't safe from that either, though, were they? Uh, I don't think so. I, th I think <laughs> it was just kind of an initiation. If you hadn't been there, you were. And uh, so it, it's pretty weird. Now, we, we had some officers on there, but were real, real nice fellas. I mean, they could just sit out there like we do and just shoot the bull and all that thing. And then of them was just some damn high class, you couldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. But you never know. But now we were lucky. Our executive officer came up through the ranks, and so he was a hell of a nice fella. And to be honest with you, when I first went aboard the ship there, they put me on KP duty. And I had a... a the boatswain mate was an Italian. His name was Pig Tally. And he was a literally smart at it because he's about like some of these colored folks, you know, that's got kind of freedom and give you a bad time if they can. And he'd do that. Now, I don't know why. I went to the exec and told him what I thought about him. I said, where I come from and live, they lived in nigger quarters. We didn't fool with them. <laughs> I went out of that. I got he took me out. I wasn't there for three days. So I never had to worry about that no more. And that's when I struck for O Division ordinance for Gunner's Mate. Was uh, was being a Gunner's Mate something that you wanted to do, or was it just the, the, heat, the quickest way out of that kitchen? Well, no, no, everybody had to, had to, you know, yeah, when you're a seaman something. like it, everybody has to go through that mess cooking biz. Did, did, did you choose Gunner's Mate, or was that just the first thing available? I, I kind of choose it. I had a couple of friends on her. One from, he was originally from Texas. He wound up in uh, Spokane, Washington as a preacher. And I talked to him here last year, but I don't know if he's still in. He's about three or four years older than me. And then I had another buddy. It was the three of us. He lived in uh, uh, Des Plaines, Illinois. Well, he come out and he wound up uh, chief of police in Des Plaines. And then after he finished his retirement there, he was elected city commissioner. And then from there he finally died. And I never told his name was Kenneth Fredericks. But this other boy, he was a big fella, pretty good sized Texan, but he lived in Washington. Uh, his name was uh, James Parks Terry. And so we were real close. And uh, that's, I guess that's why I got into it. I just liked him, and they were a big help to me. Yeah, you want to be with your buddies. It's understandable. Yeah. Cause when when, uh, when the war was over and you guys were there in Okinawa, what happened next? Where did you go? I mean, where, what happened? Well, what when happened? we left left Okinawa after the war coming home, uh, we come to Midway, and from there, we uh, rode out a storm one night. We was doing a 60-degree roll, and I was on the wheel watch, having to steer it and watching that compass and going right into that storm, riding them waves. And listen, them waves were so high, it's like getting up on a mountain. You'd get up there, and you'd fall off down in that valley just like taking a big dive, 
pop up the other side. Well, unless you could walk it on a 60 degree road, you can walk on the side of the bulkhead as well as the deck. You know, we, we, we were lucky we survived that. Because Bull Hosley took one of his feet out one time and, and let him ride in the storm, and he lost several destroyers like that. You got to go with the storm. You can't go sideways. So I guess that's what happened. So you you guys got through the storm and you headed into coming Pearl. home. You went into Pearl or, or well, we come on into Pearl, capped off fuel tanks, and from there we come on in to uh, Los Angeles, I believe. No, I must have San Francisco. I mean, we're going on the uh, the gate. And that's where they put us on a troop train, and we wound up coming all the way through Cheyenne, Wyoming, down to St. Louis. And when I got to St. Louis there, I met up with a ticket agent there. He said, let me see your ticket. I give it to him. And he put me on the Southern Bell. I got home quicker from there. But then I was going through uh, uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, got off the train and run to a bar and got a bottle of, all you get, I think, was a bottle of brandy. <laughs> and then we wasn't supposed to have it on the train. The MPs took that. <laughs> so that was the end of that. But it was snowing. You know, I had on a T-shirt. It wasn't cold, and that snow was so dry, you couldn't make a snowball out of it. Weird. So where were you discharged, or when were you discharged? Uh, December the 15th, 1945, here. In New Orleans? In New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And what happened then? Where'd you go? You went I back? went back to Alexandria. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to work for a sign company, Neon Sign Company, and I worked there all till I got married. And... Uh, Went from there to California and stayed a while, and my wife had never been away from home, and she was one of 12. And so in about a month later, she wanted to come home, so she did. I was working in a rubber plant. She was working in the daytime, or at night, and I was working in the daytime, vice versa. So we always met at the gate going out and in. And so then she became pregnant, and so she came on home, and I stayed a little while longer than I came on back home. And then I went back to work for the sign company, doing neon sign work. And then from there, after a while, up to about 1950, I guess, I went into the trucking business hauling cattle. And so I did that for 40 years. Mm -hmm. My dad drove trucks for a long, long time. Well, you know, I, 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 actually, I didn't, actually, I didn't like it. I didn't love it, but it was what I could get the most out of for what I was doing and my, my capabilities, I'll put it this way. So I, 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 I devoted myself religiously to it. I uh, I wouldn't pull in no truck stops or get blocked up and sit with all these guys, you know, sitting there talking about whose truck could run the fastest or all this kind of bull, you know. I didn't do that. I'd always try to park out where I could get out if I needed to stop. And if I stopped, I'd get a cup of coffee or a piece of fried chicken, and I was on my way. Because, you know, I, I didn't make a dime till I delivered the load. And then when I got back, I had to get on back and get another one, because I went every day, seven days a week, for 40 years. So I, did, I devoted myself religiously to it. I didn't like it, but I said, well, I don't know why I got it, but I'm in now, so I'm too deep to quit, can't give up. Well, do you think it's, uh, is this your first time here at this museum? Yeah. It is? I know you haven't gone through it yet, but, but do you think it's important that a museum like this exists to show people, kids, you know, what you guys did during the war? Well, yes, you know, there's so many people. It's just like the damn poor old Jews when the Germans got through with them. And a lot of people don't believe that they were went through what they did. And so, you know, the seeing is the proof. 
And I, I think it's a great idea because, listen, uh, we see a little bit of the history of the Civil War, but it's, it's probably a lot of it, you know, is, is a lot of it's make-believe because I don't believe they've had very much of an opportunity back in those days for <laughs> no movie cameras. Right. But anyway, it kind of gives you a pretty good idea. But uh, this way I think it's better because, you know, it's real. Now, you you know, I, I won't tell you this much. I know a lot of veterans, they absolutely, they exaggerate the stories. They don't, they don't tell it like it is sometimes. It's just like when that suicide plane come over, one of the boys made a remark, this is not too far back. He said, that plane come over, I touched the bottom of it with my hand. Well, I know that's how much you're lying because he was back there midship, and he hit right there up there at me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know that ain't, that's not true, but you know, people a lot of times will do anything for attention. Well, that's like these boys, my boys, you know, my wife would always tell, don't, uh, don't ask him about that. And I said, well, uh, my biggest problem was at night for a long time, I, I dreamed of war. I, I went through it a many a night trying to sleep. And I guess that's why she thought, you know, that uh, it was bad on me, but uh, these these fellas that fool around and come back from all these wars and make out like it, you know, they go berserk and did this and then that, they was berserk to start with. I don't, I just, I, I never felt it that way. Maybe I was just too, too young to worry about it. I don't know what, but it, it it never bothered me about being out or going through all that stuff. I mean, I, I, I tried to make it look like I was just a bad dream, and I guess maybe that's how I survived. But I just never did talk about it. I, to me, it was like old history. Didn't know what be, how, what, how people would be interested, or I didn't know maybe how to start explaining to him what I, how I felt and what I saw. I just couldn't do it, just didn't. I'm glad you're doing it now. Well, uh, you know, in two or three years' time, you'd go through different phases so many times till you, you, can't, you can't hardly cover it all. You're just more or less hitting your highlights. Sure, absolutely, it was a long time ago. Yeah, well, yeah. But lots of it, I can just close my eyes and still see it. But uh, like I said, I don't, I don't worry about it, and uh, I just, I, I'm the kind of person around home there, I may sit around for days and not say nothing about nothing. Just, I, I, if I don't have anything to say, I just don't talk. <laughs> That's a good quality to have. Well, I don't get in trouble that way either. Uh, amen to that. Well, uh, Tell me, um, were you the, the ship? The ship went to Japan. The Daily went to Japan after the bomb was dropped in Nagasaki, wasn't it? Yeah. Tell me about that. Did you go ashore and all? Oh that? Lord, yeah. yeah. Uh, they when we went to Nagasaki there, they sent us ashore, and I went all through that damn place, walking, looking at it. And uh, if you ever seen the picture, oh yeah. Well, did you see the water tower in there? Just kind of like that. Yeah. Well, that is the area. That's where I was at. I went all through that. I even brought home, I went through one of those uh, machine shops and brought home a, a Japanese engineer book with all the uh, engineering things that they need to you know, build and stuff. And I had it for a long time, but I don't know whatever got lost in the shuffle. But that's the only souvenir I had. And then when I got back to the ship, we, uh, we had a lot of Japanese soldiers there, you know, doing extra detail work for us. and. Then they brought a big load of damned old uh, 31 caliber Japanese rifles and bayonets. They're still in the Cosmoline wrapped up. And I got one of those and brought it home. And uh, I don't know what I guess, I believe maybe Danny, Tommy got it, huh? I've kind of sporterized it. And never, it was brand new. And I had one bullet after I come home, I shot it. And it had a bayonet about that long on it. And my other son, I just said, talking about he used to get it and play with it. I didn't know all these things. They were little. 
But uh, that's that's what I brought home. And then from there, we went to another Japanese base. Uh, well, I, I, I can't recall exactly the name of it now, but we were there and we rode out a storm one night and they sent us out to ride out this storm with a tanker, you know, stay with it so it wouldn't nothing happen and we was out in front of it. And I lost my compass reading in that storm and I made a complete circle in front of that tanker before I got back on course. Nothing was ever said. I don't guess anybody ever knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Not even the officer's neck. He never even said nothing. I never could figure that one out. I said, well, well I was glad. But uh, we were there and we, was, we were anchored up into a, a little spur of the harbor. And it was trees about over the harbor. And there was some big old tankers in there just built a tanker hull. Huge son of a gun that they were building. It was tied up in there under them trees. And right across from me there, they had a Japanese airport there. And they took our tank, our tanks, some of our tanks, had to land them there. And when at the airport, and they'd take them old tanks with them flamethrowers, mm -hmm. and that's what they're shooting them planes with, burning them up. Mm. And I know the name of the place right now, but I hadn't thought about it in years. Mm. But then, He'd come out there and be in the harbor, them Japanese building them big old barges, garbage barges, with just one man and a big paddle. And you know how they stick that? I don't know if you've ever seen it. They control that thing and paddle it with that paddle. It's just like this. Beat all I ever seen. I tried to do it. It don't work. It's too good for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's about all I got to ask you, unless you got anything else you want to say. I think we about covered it. Well, I don't, you know, I like I say, we just more or less reminisce sometimes on the head of this horse and horses in the back of the court and all that kind of stuff. That's all right. But anyway, I mean, that's, as I recall, that's the best of my memory. And uh, that's I've got a pretty good memory because I can remember back uh, when I was about two or three years old yeah. very well. That's about all you can ask. Well, I just, I should have asked you this before, but I don't I need to ask you now. Is it okay that I recorded you on camera today? I don't care. Okay. <laughs> I figured I should have asked you before I started, but I forgot. I well, you know, I mean, after all, if you're going to do something, do it to the best of your ability. Amen to that. So, I mean, it's all right. I mean, at least it's like planting a tree. You know, if you leave something behind you, well, you've, you've done something. But most all the trees I planted in my childhood from now, They've been cutting them down. I planted them in the yard. It must have been too bad. I, I planted a hickory tree one time from a hickory nut. And I was going to graft a pecan to it. And it finally got so big that to, to my, my daughter, my youngest daughter, lives at the house now. And in the backyard, got so many hickory nuts since they had to cut it down. Then I planted a cedar tree like this. And it wound up <laughs> tall, tall. So, I mean, that's my tree planting. Yeah. So, you know, like I say, you try to leave some kind of legacy, and, and I assume this is a legacy, you know. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's part of history, actually, that I never expected to participate in. So, you know, I, I feel, I hope I feel good about it. Well, I think you did an excellent job. So, like I say, I, I'm sure that if we took more time, because I... I got the, I got the album, my book, right there, and it's even got a map in it of every places that we went. So, you know, that's it. And we stopped at a little place called Esperito Santos, an island in the Pacific, mm -hmm. and the water was so damn clear you could see the bottom way down. And we stopped there one time, kind of rested up for some reason or other when we was coming back into the Pacific from the California. And they have them fuzzy wuzzies, you know, the Africans and they yeah. have old bushy fuzzy hair. Yeah. Call them fuzzy wuzzies. And we'd throw chains and quarters and dimes and fifty cent pieces into that water and they'd they's out there and they'd dive down and, and get that money before it hit the bottom. You could watch them, you could see them. We did a lot of that. 
all this kind of stuff, you know. Uh, that, that's just, that's, you know, different times. There wasn't no war, just, just something that would take place. I guess it was some sort of an entertainment. That was about it. Is that correct? What was the Silver Star awarded for? For the Okinawa, the deal, you know, shooting planes yeah. and uh, being wounded and, you know, trying to help the boys that was hurt and, you know, just, I guess, just doing my job. That's the only thing I can tell you. And I thought it was a good deal because right after the war, see, you had to have a certain amount of points to get out. And then the Silver Star automatically gave you enough. I think it's supposed to be about 60 something points. So when I got that, I got out. I mean, the Silver Star to a sailor, that's, that's pretty. That's heavy number stuff. three. I, 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 it says temporary because I think at first I was recommended for the Navy Cross. Mm -hmm. But I got the Silver Star. And uh, like I say, that's, 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 I guess, not bad. I don't know. I didn't, no big deal with me. No, but I mean, for a sailor, for a, for a swabby to get a to get a silver yeah, star, yeah. it's a pretty serious deal. Yeah. And you got that for the day that the uh, that you were pulling the wounded off your gun. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that and the Purple Heart. Yeah. Well, that's pretty. That's important stuff. Yeah. Well, like I say, that in my ribbons, I I don't know if this is one Danny's got there or not, but had all they put all of these stars on these ribbons for the. Places you've been more than once, right, you know. Stars, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. like I say, I, I got a pretty good handful of them, I guess. Do you, do you, uh, if you had to do it all over again, would you do it again? Well, you know, I, I would, I would think so. Yes, I really think I would. You know, because now at my age and everything. Uh, I guess it would be, it would be better than seeing some of the young ones go. They'd have to learn and have to learn the hard way. So I, I, I really don't know, but uh, I, I kind of miss it. I, I, I would have loved to went back and took another little ride on that tin can, but I just, I never, never did. So when you got discharged, that was it, huh? You were done. Well, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I just, after that I got married and had a family and was in trucking business and I, I just didn't have time for nothing but just stay with the grinder. Understand. And so have uh, you ever been to Baton Rouge and seen the destroyer up there? Yeah, I yeah. went over it, 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 it they got it decorated up nothing like it. Yeah. They got it pumped up too much extra stuff on it. Yeah. That's not really what it was. Mine was the same class. Same That's class. a Fletcher class. Right. Now we did right after Maybe the Admiralty Islands, we did mount us some 30 caliber machine guns on each side of the midship there. And that was the only extra guns we had besides the 20s and 40s and 5 inch. Mm -hmm. We had, I want to think we had five 40 millimeters. We had the five 5 inch, and we had. Three, I don't think we had four, I think we had three twin 40 millimeters. Yeah, I'm trying to think right now. One on each bridge wing and one back at midship. I think there were two midships, weren't there? Well, that's what, I, that's what I'm thinking. I'm not, I, think I can't remember. Sure. Yeah. But I believe it was. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think there are. I think there were two, two four. Maybe. Been six, because there might have been two aft. Weren't there two near the stern, too? Or am I thinking 20 mil? That might be 20 millimeters. That was 20 mil. On the fan tail, there was about three. And then, charges, yeah. and then on up, I don't know, seeming like on uh, about almost about two thirds from the front or back, whichever back fan tail, I think it was two forties there. I know we used to go out on target practice. They'd bring these old old uh, A twenty. Planes, they would put plywood planes, you know, to me, but they never did 
see much service in bombing or nothing like that. But they used them for tow planes to tow targets for us. To, it was a sleeve, and we'd shoot at that sleeve. And one day we was out there, one of them old boys on a 20 millimeter, and they give him permission to fire. And the first damn shot, he cut the line off the tail of that, that damn sleeve right up close to the plane. They said, we, we leave you, y'all shooting too close. <laughs> they weren't shooting at him, I guess. But oh, why he shot. Hell, he might have been trying to hit those plane just for the hell of it. I don't know. But he sure cut the line and, and the sleeve dropped off. What was it like firing those 40 millimeters? And that's, that's a pretty well, serious weapon. They go in like this, and there's four clips to the round, and you can feed and shoot about 120 rounds a minute. But the way they shoot, it's like pum pum, it just jarred your chest all to pieces, man. You just, it just, it just vibrations shaking you like that. It's rough. When when you guys would get close to the shore, would you open fire with the forty millimeters too, or just the five inches? Uh, usually just five inch. They did, you know. We was wasn't that close to the beach. We was, you know. I would say, I'm gonna guess it a. Get half a mile, three quarters of a mile away. Uh, just enough to try to clear the beach for the troops to land. And uh, that's what we did is uh, we escorted a lot of tankers and LSTs. And that was the first part. And then after that, that's when they signed us up as just a uh, destroyer squad and it was escorting uh, cruisers are escorting battle wagons like the, the pocket battleships, the Alaska and the Guam. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was about it. I mean, we, we, was, we was doing something all the time. Yeah. What did you do? I meant to ask you this before and I just forgot. What little downtime you had when you were aboard ship, what did you do when, you, when there wasn't anything to do, when you weren't working? What would you do aboard ship? Play cards? Sleep, write letters. Uh, well, make no, we it just, <laughs> uh, just have bull sessions and you know shoot the bull. And then if we wasn't doing nothing, we'd they'd open up the store and we could buy candies and gums or if we needed uh, t-shirts or shorts or something like that, we'd do that. And then you forget to put the candy or the gum in your locker, and when you looked again, it was gone. <laughs> So nothing was saved, and uh, I slept on the top bunk. We had three high, and so that was my job. I get to get in that bunk, and uh, I don't know. I mean, we just we if we wasn't doing nothing else in a little old porch, you know, anchored in. Well, we'd show movies at night. We had our own movie camera and a screen, and we'd just show wherever, which way the ship was headed. We either had it at the bow or the fantail, and it always mount the camera up in the gun mount, five-inch gun mount. Mm -hmm. So then we would have movies in there, and if we'd seen all of them, well, we'd be anchored up with some other ships. We'd swap out films with them that they hadn't seen and we hadn't seen. We'd just switch that out. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. Sometimes some of the boys, if you was in the harbor there, they'd, some of them was good swimmers, and they'd go out swimming and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we did too, but I usually waited till I got down to a beach somewhere and swim because uh, I, I just didn't want my feet too far from the bottom. But it, like at uh, Admiralty Islands, there it was an old Carl. Man, it eat you up. Yeah. And uh, we'd go ashore like that. They'd make us go out there and and dig a damn hole in that coral, and water would filter into it. It'd, put drums down in it. They'd take them big drums, cut the tops off of them, stack it full of beer, and then turn that 100 octane in on it, chill it down mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be so hot. <laughs> American ingenuity. Oh, Lord, listen. That is one thing that the Americans can do. They can improvise. That's one thing, and I, went, I worked for an oil company one time in 
must have been in 63. And this fellow, this boss told me, he said, you can do more things than anybody I ever see. He said, you are an improviser. He said, but we don't really have no new room for an improviser. I said, well, uh, you know, you, you, any old port in the storm, whatever you can do, you need to do it. That's what you do. So, you, you know, you can come up with a lot of damn good ideas that most folks, if they want to go by the book, won't never come up with nothing. And so that's kind of, you know, what the thing's are about. But uh, I did I did improvise a hell of a lot. You got to do what you got to do. Well, that about runs me dry. Okay. Any, any stories maybe you might have heard that, that Well, I, most of the stories we didn't cover. Or well, no, he he covered a lot of them, but most of the stories have a lot more details in them. Yeah. You know that, that he's talking out of his memory now, but over sixty years, sure. some of the stories yeah. he told us had a lot more bullets flying, a lot more of this and that, you know, than what you actually heard. Right. Well, I mean, that's but, what you expected, uh, you know. But, you know, in my own personal opinion, he's something to be proud of. Absolutely. You know, he's... I could sit here and talk to you all damn day. <laughs> you know, he, he, he's seen a lot. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, going on to Japan when the bomb was dropped. Now, yeah. that's something to be scared about. Sure. First of all, what's all that radiation? Yeah. Well, yeah, I just, really he walked. He walked in the middle of it. Yeah, they didn't really know about that. I, I really think that I have a very bad skin rash, dry skin, irritating. I have to go to the doctor and take medicine for it all the time, and it don't make much headway. And I really think that that between that and the Pacific, the tropics, mm -hmm. I think that that's what caused a lot of it. That radiation. Yeah. Well, that and my biggest theory was not knowing all this till later on in life, when he walked on the shore after they dropped that bomb, a selfish reason, that would have been time to bring something back yeah. to remember that. Right. That, when he t tells you about them Corsairs. Now, Let me tell you something. You, you, they, they wiped out a big chunk of Japan with them two bombs. Now, at, at uh, Hiroshima, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a small one. Nagasaki was the big one. They killed 100,000. And then there's more than that, that that died. It got burnt pretty bad because, listen, that old radiation is hot. It's a lot hotter than the sun. Well, that you hear a lot about war today, about soldiers getting killed with friendly fire. Mm -hmm. Well, I've heard over the past, back in Corsairs, when them Japanese bombers are planes would come in to attack like his ship, mm -hmm. them Corsairs were under order to never cease fire. Mm -hmm. So them or Corsairs were shooting 50 calories all over his boat. No, yeah. All well, the planes what I... were shooting us down. Yeah. You know we have a Corsair here at the museum. Really? Mm -hmm. when you, I'm assuming you guys are going to tour yeah. the museum. Right. Go across the street that way. The brand new building. The US. Just ask anybody where the U.S. Freedom Pavilion is. They'll, they'll know. Yeah. When you go in there, there's five airplanes hanging in there. One of them's a Corsair. As it reminds you, I made one. I took a, a 30 caliber bullet and made a Corsair mm -hmm. with, this, mm -hmm. with wings and everything on it. And it took the butt of, butt of a 75 millimeter uh, shell, the projector, the brass, cut it out, made an ashtray, and then mounted that on it. And, I mean, it, 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 that, that bullet, the way it's designed with the wings, is like a Corsair. And I gave it to my sister-in-law, and I don't know what she, she, well, I guess they kids tore it up. But I thought about it all the time, and I wish I could have kept that, because it had been something really, it was a good novelty. Yeah. Because I took that projector and took the powder out of it, and all that, and then put the bullet back in, silver soldered the, the tail fin and the wing, and all of that on the gold wings. It's, it's identical. We need to go see it when you, when we leave out of here. You guys go across after you do whatever you want to do. Do you need us to come back for something? No, no, done? no, we're done. We're done. Okay. We're just well, my favorite story is about right them now. Saragona Straits. Oh yeah. When he uh, that's when, when they read. drove past the Jap, they was under radio silence. Mm -hmm. When they drove past them ships, turned around and sunk them. You mm -hmm. know, Japanese didn't know what hit them. Yeah. No, I, I that, knowing you guys were coming, that was one of the main things I wanted to touch on was that. But uh, yeah, go check out the Corsair. You'll, it'll 